Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Fireside Chat with Shelly Archambeau. Just a quick reminder to everyone to post your questions in the chat and we'll answer them throughout the presentation. It's now my pleasure to introduce Shelly Archambeau. Shelly is the former CEO of Metric Stream, who Reed Hoffman, the co-founder and former executive chairman of LinkedIn, describes as the woman who pulled off the most incredible Silicon Valley turnaround you ever heard of. Shelly currently sits on the boards of Nordstrom, Verizon, Roper Technologies, and Okta. She advises the Royal Bank of Canada, Capital Markets, Forbes Ignite, as well as growing startups. She is regularly named on who's who's lists in the technology field and is the protagonist of the Harvard Business uh, School case study, Becoming a CEO. She is the author of Unapologetically Ambitious, Take Risks, Break Barriers, and Create Success on Your Own Terms, a book that will inspire you and provide the tools to enable you to fight the battles, make the trade-offs, and create the life you want. In her spare time, she is a Forbes contributor, runs a gourmet dinner club, and writes a blog that provides career advice, insight, and other musings from her career. We're very excited to have Shelly with us today. So welcome, Shelly. Thanks so much, Shelly. I've been looking forward to this. Okay. Well, let's start off with a question about how you've been intentional and ambitious throughout your career to kick things off. There are not that's many successful minority female CEOs or executives in Silicon Valley. What did you do differently to achieve such a prestigious career? Hmm. Well, you know, Jolene, I have actually been very intentional throughout my life. It was very clear to me early on that the odds just weren't in my favor. I grew up in the 60s for elementary school, a time of high racial strife where as many people that thought there should be civil rights, you had just as many that didn't. My family moved around a bunch as my father, who didn't have a college degree, moved around to take job opportunities to help support his family. And I landed in places where I tend to be one of the only, the only black girl. And people let me know they didn't really care much about me based on what they said and what they did, the whole bit. So therefore, I learned to help improve my odds of getting what I wanted. But if I was intentional, I actually set a goal, set a target, and then work toward it, I actually improved the opportunity for it to actually happen. So my career really set off in my junior year in high school when I had the obligatory conversation with a guidance counselor, you know, the conversation on, are you going to go to college? What do you want to do after college? Well, I knew college, but after college, it was just a job. I had no idea. And she said, well, what do you like to do? And I said, oh, clubs, right? I'm in all these organizations, National Honor Society, American Field Service. I'm even a Girl Scout, but don't tell anybody. Um, and through that, she said, well, you know, clubs and business, kind of the same thing put people together, go after a common mission, get things done. And I said, great. I like clubs. I like business. I'll go run a business. And when I looked up, the people who run businesses were called CEOs. So I said, all right, I'll become a CEO. Now, did I actually know what that meant? <laughs> Not really, <laughs> but it became my goal. And I spent the rest of my career basically working towards making that happen by figuring out what did CEOs do? What were their educations? What kind of jobs did they have? and then trying to indeed go after the education, the experience, right, and the skills that would be required. Fantastic, thank you. So you've had a lot of amazing jobs, one right after the other. How did you pick those career roles? Was it intentional or luck? <laughs> well, based on my last answer, you know it was intentional, <laughs> but I do think you can do things to improve your luck. So uh, let's go back to the whole thing of setting a goal. So once I have a goal, something I'm trying to achieve, I ask myself two key questions. The first one is, what has to be true for me to achieve that goal? And that means I have to do the research. So I want to be a CEO. Well, what has to be true? So I looked at the different CEOs. I did the research, which, trust me, back then was much harder than it is today. Um, and I looked at what education they had, what kind of jobs they took, the whole bit. I picked technologies and industry because it was a growing industry. And I picked IBM because it was one of the leading companies in tech. And I said, great, I'll go be CEO of IBM, right? Naive 20-year-old popping out of college, but that's what I did. So anyway, in doing that, every single CEO started out in sales. So I said, all right, I don't know what it's about sales, but it must be the path to power. So I'll start out in sales. And then it was clear that, you know, if you want to be a CEO, you have to have P&L responsibilities. 
So I looked to see what kind of jobs actually have P&L responsibilities and how soon can I get one of those? And it was a branch manager. And so I said, all right, what jobs do I need to become a branch manager? And I went after those jobs. And I, so literally every step, it was looking at where am I now? What do I need to do to get to the next key step, right, on the career ladder? And then how do I do that? And then I go work to make that happen. And part of making it work, to, working to make it happen is not just having the plan in your own mind. It's really important to tell people around you what you want to do so they can actually help you achieve it. Because if people don't know what you want to do, they won't know to give you certain opportunities or to invite you to certain events or situations that might actually help you achieve the things that you want to do. So being intentional, absolutely. So I've heard that you've always recommend that people focus on developing their strengths instead of focusing on their weaknesses. Why do you recommend this? And can you provide an example of how you've done this successfully? Mm, yes. So here's what happens. When you're building your career and frankly, building your reputation, you become known for what you're good at. And if you think about it, think about people around you, right? It's like, oh yeah, you know, so-and-so really good strategic mind, right? This person's super analytic. This one's really creative, right? You know who to go to when you need creative ideas versus who to go to if you just need something done. Typically different skill sets. Well, what that means is we all become known for what our strengths are. Therefore, if by building and spending time to actually even strengthen those strengths even more, we become even more superior, more knowledgeable, more credible, et cetera. Versus if you spend time just strengthening your weaknesses, well, nobody's going to say, well, yeah, let's bring, let's bring Jolene on board because she's actually less bad at this. <laughs> okay. You're just not, it's not going to happen. It's all based on what your strengths are. So now I'm not talking about skills. This doesn't mean that you never add new skills. That's completely different. I'm just talking about key strengths and capabilities that you have. By strengthening those and making those better, they shine even more. So one of my strengths, I'm a good leader. And I kept doubling down on that. I wanted to be an even better leader, a more inspirational leader, more effective leader. I was always working on that. And if you talk to people, I'm, I'm known for sure for my leadership skills. And nobody mentions the fact that, oh, what should I say? I'm not necessarily the person that you want to create the spreadsheet <laughs> to put together the financial model, right? I can read the financial model, but you don't want me putting it together. 